The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight, expertise, top guest. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now to Dave Hooker. Ready. Welcome to the program as we are loaded up. Good morning to you and yours on the message board. It is March, so we'll certainly talk some Tennessee basketball. Would Rick Barnes retire with a Final Four berth? We'll discuss. Also, later in the program, Tennessee, this kind of floated under the radar. Rodney Garner and Willie Martinez sign a new deal. It's better to have Rodney Garner or is it worse to have Willie Martinez? Tim Banks says the Vols have the best defensive line in the nation. That's strong. And then an Alabama transfer looking for a home once again. Iowa wasn't that place. Should the Vols go after Caden Proctor? Clemson is looking to tear apart the ACC, which it seems like it's just a matter of time. And then Tennessee's odds to win the tournament may be better than you think. So we're loaded up. We'll be joined by Jimmy Himes here in just a moment. But first, I'll start with you. How are you, Caleb Calhoun? Tremendous, Dave. We March Madness was basically underway with the play-in games yesterday. No one really factors in the play-in games to their bracket. But, uh, oh, my gosh. How could anybody watch that Virginia-Colorado State game and see Virginia play and go, yeah, there should be more teams in the NCAA tournament? No, well, the Virginia it. game in particular reminded me. And by the way, if you can, I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd hit that like and subscribe button. Make sure your notifications on are on. Ron Slay tweeted out, who will join us later in the week. Ron tweeted out that, boy, it's tough watching Virginia play because they're very defensive-oriented, slow. It's not just that they might not – should be in the tournament, Caleb. It's just that's Kevin O'Neill all all over again. That's exactly what was going on when I was at the University of Tennessee. And I've said this before, and some people kind of laugh it off a little bit, but there were times I was on campus, Caleb, and I wasn't a hundred percent sure that there was a Tennessee basketball game going on. That's how irrelevant it was at the time. I mean, and it was, yeah, you're right. And Kevin O'Neill was the worst representative for that. By the way, Buzz Peterson played a very slow brand of basketball too, for people who don't remember. That was a very boring brand of basketball on top of not winning also. But yeah, that was Virginia the other day. And this style, I, I say all the time, never does well in the tournament. And it, you know, they everyone wants to point out that one time they won the national title when every single player on their team was a sharpshooter. So they could do that. So... I, I, I'm with you. I hate that style. It's so it's one thing to have that style and be winning. But when you have that style and you're losing, it's the worst thing in the world to watch, isn't it? I e by the way, similar to football. It's one thing to be a defensive team. But to be a defensive team and Jeremy Pruitt's your head coach and you can't win any games that way, it's worse. No, but it's really not even that great when you're winning, is it? Well, doesn't it affect your recruiting long term? I mean, that it just is that Virginia and the way Kevin O'Neill used to run a basketball program is just brutal to watch. Oh, it is. It is. By the way, Purdue runs a similar style for those who don't realize. Um, Purdue runs a very similar style. But yeah, even when you're winning, it can be you can still recruit well because think about it. If you're a player who wants to develop to be an NBA role player, those defensive minded coaches are where you go to play for. Because they'll actually kind of help coach you up to be a solid 10-year NBA role player. The most underrated job in America is an NBA role player. Because everybody talks about the stars in the NBA more than anything else. And then they'll say the NBA doesn't play defense. If you are a solid defensive basketball player with real athleticism, you'll have an NBA roster spot for a long time. And you can make a lot of money doing that. No, you completely can. Speaking of making a lot of money, how about BetUS? 125% bonus on your first three deposits, plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, an official partner of Off the Hook Sports. BetUS, Jimmy Himes joining us in just a second as we link up with him. Again, 
Bet US, that 125% bonus. Fantastic. Bet US. America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. Today's tough question. Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. All righty, let's dive into this right now. Rick Barnes' career to this point is defined by the regular season. Rick Barnes to this point has one final four on his resume. That's not enough to be considered an elite coach. Two would be. A national championship would be. That would transfer him into a whole different level, elevate him into another level from really good to great. And then let's say that next level is elite. We know that Rick Barnes turned 70 this summer. Would he potentially retire if Tennessee made the final four, if Tennessee won a national championship? What say you, Caleb Callahan? Would Rick Burns retire if Tennessee won a national championship? That is an interesting question. If they just make a Final Four, I am heck no. A resounding heck no. And I I don't think he retires if they win a national championship either. I said this about Rick Barnes for a long time, and I, I think it's a testament to his character. I think it's a testament to the type of man that he is, because I think, honestly, um, Dave, I don't think you can have a better person coaching you than Rick Barnes. I don't know if you agree with me on that, but I think he, in terms of character, he's one of the top five character coaches in all the college sports, Rick Barnes is. And, I mean, it's like him, Mark, Rick, David, Cutcliffe are my top three. I think Rick Barnes is in this because he likes coaching and developing players. I think he's he I think he genuinely loves developing players for their future. I think that's the whole reason he's in this. And he's by the way, in the past, he sacrificed potentially being a championship team because of his principles and what he believes is important to develop players for whatever they're going to be after they leave. I think a guy like that that is so devout deep with his faith, I think he's going to be doing this for as long as he can. Okay, we'll play the other side of it. I think you have to look at this. There are a lot of different ways. You mentioned his faith. There are a lot of different ways that he could potentially get back and do things, whether or not you like what Nick Saban is doing and how he's doing it. Rick Barnes would be received in a similar regard as David Cutcliffe, who wanted to work for the SEC. So he would have those options to be around basketball. I don't know what's in his heart of hearts, and I don't think he's necessarily going to tell us right off the bat, but I'll go ahead and tell you right now, if I'm Rick Barnes, there is no question in my mind that I'm retiring if I win a championship. I want to be remembered like that. I want to be remembered like John Elway. So what's going on in his mind, I'm not sure, but I'm telling you, I would walk off into the sunset. But Rick Barnes isn't doing this for some legacy. That's what I mean. Rick Barnes, I mean, I, I again, whatever you guys think religiously, I'm not here to lecture anybody, but the only thing legacy Rick Barnes cares about is like when he's standing at the pearly gates and he's judged on what he did for people in his life. I Fair. mean. And St. Peter I, will be there for him just as they are on <laughs> Thursday night. St. Peter's will be there for him. That is the absolute truth. And. <laughs> Uh, I believe Rick Barnes. Um, see, that's where there's a big difference between Barnes and Saban. Look, I actually do believe, Dave, that Saban was in it for developing players. But come on, Saban wanted to win. Saban wanted to leave a legacy in college football. I don't think Rick Barnes cares what his legacy is or what's written about him. Rick Barnes only cares what his creator says about him. What He only cares about what his maker says about him when he meets his maker. I mean, he's that type of person. And... I think Rick Barnes think now he's accepted a handsome salary to do this. Okay. But I'm not, so it's not like he's doing this for free, but I do believe that Rick Barnes thinks he was put on this earth to help develop potential basketball players into good people. And 
Out, I mean, yes, he did fail with Tristan Thompson. Y'all, y'all can read about what Tristan has done to Khloe Kardashian over the years. It's been really, really awful. But uh, <laughs> really, really, that's that's quite a left turn. I, I, uh, but yeah, you do have to remember this. You have to remember this. He flirted with UCLA pretty strongly, so it's not like he has a tie. It's not like Philip Fulmer. I think Philip Fulmer would have been happy just kind of riding off into not a sunset but a cloudy sort of day and getting General Nealon's record of all-time wins. I don't think Rick Barnes wants to go out like that. I think a championship would change everything. He hasn't give us, given us much insight, but it'd have to be huge. Uh, I don't foresee him moving somewhere else, but if he does, he needs to call Boundless Moving from their two-hour minimum to turnkey operations. They've got you covered. Their motto, personal service without limits, not just a tagline. It's part of who they are in their DNA. Google Boundless Moving if you're in the Carolinas or East Tennessee. They are fantastic. Boundless Moving. Tell them Off the Hook Sports sent you. It would change the way he is viewed tremendously to make two Final Fours. Let's say that in and of itself. So I ask you on the poll question on our YouTube page, please uh, go ahead and vote on that. It's pretty simple. And I think I know where Caleb stands. If I'm Rick Barnes and I win a natty, I'm just fired up, retiring on a high note, completely 50-50, which is our goal each and every day on our poll question. I think there's, there's arguments to be made on both sides. Now, if he just makes the final four, let's tweak this a little bit. That's two final fours. That, again, elevates you to another level. You're not a lucky made it guy and then your career was just okay so if it's two final fours not a natty you are viewed different are you considering retirement if you're rick barnes is that enough for your legacy no and that's a resounding no because i'm saying what i think rick barnes is but even if he's not that even if he's what you say he is dave you don't just retire with the final four and no natty you go for the, you go for the jugular. You go for the natty. Still, you start to think, eh, I just got a final four. I think I'm knocking on the door. I think I can get that natty. That's what you do. So I think, yeah, no, he's not retiring if he just goes to the final four. That's crazy talk. How crazy that is. That's completely crazy or not. Portions of the program brought to you by our uh, good friends at. Uh, Again, at Joe Newbert Collision Centers, if you have any sort of issue with your car, Newbert Collision is where you need to be. Again, Newbert Collision offices in North and West Knoxville, and they bring you our appearance with John Adams each and every Tuesday. So we're linking up with uh, Jimmy Himes here momentarily. Uh, let's go to uh, what I think is something that kind of flew under the radar because of March Madness. You have Rodney Garner. And you have Willie Martinez re-upping to contracts. So let's ask kind of a weird question in an odd sort of way. What the H? What the? What was he thinking? Release the hounds. The Dave Hooker Show. K -k 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 keep cool. A presentation of offthehooksports.com. All right. We had made plenty of conversation about the fact that Willie Martinez wasn't signed through last season. Well, he is now. It kind of flew under the radar just a little bit. It happened earlier this week. So here's what we can tell you. Tennessee finalized extensions for two defensive assistant coaches before spring football began. That would be secondary coach Willie Martinez and defensive line coach Rodney Garner, both a one-year extension to their current contracts according to rocky top insider so i ask you what is more impactful to tennessee's program and i want to see these answers on the message board the fact that tennessee keeps garner or who people made a run at including auburn his home school or they have to continue to deal with willie martinez who has fielded an incredibly bad secondary since he's been in knoxville which is more impactful moving forward on tennessee's program Caleb it's keeping Rodney Garner keeping Rodney Garner is the big deal out of this I mean 
Willie Martinez, partially because he's not the only guy coaching that secondary. You can also have Tim Banks. But also, the way Tennessee is constructed offensively, it's more crucial that they have an that they have a great defensive line than, they, than it is they have a great secondary. And so, or that they even have a serviceable secondary. The great defensive line is what matters the most because what they want to do, and this is the truth, Tennessee wants to get a lead with their offense, and then they want to unleash their edge rushers on you when you are trying to throw the ball to get back in the game. When that happens, you don't need that great of a secondary when you're able to do that. Okay. And I think we need to be fair to Willie Martinez for just a second. You he posed the not, question. <laughs> I know. He, I want to be fair to Willie Martinez. I mean, he's not the ultimate end-all, be-all. He's not a, the coordinator that Tim Banks is. He's not the coordinator that Josh Heupel is as a head coach. I think we can clearly go back to those guys and say, if there is a problem, that's the reason why. Willie Martinez does not determine – how many people are rushing the passer on a particular play and how many defensive backs he has to utilize covering guys running down the field. So a lot of this is on Tim Banks. But I will say this. If Tennessee went out and hired an elite defensive backs coach, Nick Saban coming up through the ranks, because he was a defensive backs coach before he became a coordinator, before he became a head coach, and before he became a legend. If you know that guy's out there, it would change Tennessee. It would change the way that back end plays if you had that guy on your list. Garner, obviously, I think is huge, a big, big factor in Tennessee's recruiting. But you and I have pointed out that recruiting at Tennessee should not be that difficult. Caleb, I'm going to go ahead and say right now that I think having to suffer through more Willie Martinez is bigger than enjoying – Rodney Garner, as far as the future of this program. I don't think Tennessee was in any position, given the fact they had replaced two coaches, to hire another coach. And here's why. You suddenly look like people are defecting, like you're a dually or something. Okay, so you certainly don't want that to happen if three coaches leave in an offseason. Even if you ran the guy off, that's still the look. Plus, you have a finite amount of money. You can't go woo anybody away when you have to pay two other coaches. Not that money is a big issue in general, but if you're going to hire an elite guy, as I proposed, then that's a factor. Don Self State Farm is always a great factor when it comes to claims. That's because he has incredible customer service. Call 423-396-2126 or go to donself.net. That's donself.net. 423-396-2126. Just go right down there to donself.net. So if I told you that you could get an elite defensive backs coach, would you take that? No, because I want the elite defensive line. That's more important than the elite defensive backs coach. I, I've said that, and by the way, you say recruiting. I think Ronnie Garner's an elite defensive line coach too. He does bring out the best in his players as an actual coach. That's, I don't, that is a fair point. I mean, he's not just a recruiter, right? Right. He's not just a recruiter. He's at Orgeron without – the personality disorders. Yes, he's had Orgeron with character. <laughs> character and without the personality disorders. And with and 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 with actual ability to speak coherently. Okay, I'm sorry. Football. Receiver. <laughs> yeah. And and by the way, but you bring up a good one because you're right, Ed Orgeron's a great defensive line coach, too. I'm not gonna take that away from him. But Rodney Garner is on that level, and he bre again. Dave, uh, let me let, let me just ask it to you this way: What is more important for Tennessee, having a great defensive line, or having a not terrible secondary? Mm. I guess hey, having great offense, deep, I guess with this offense, with this program, the way it's built, I guess uh, you're talking me out of my own. Point. I guess I would probably take having a great defensive line that can apply pressure, that can flip the field. All you really want out of that defense is not to give up the big play and to flip the field, what, twice a game? Either It doesn't have to be a turnover. It doesn't have to be an interception. Sometimes a sack leads to a third and 16, and then you're behind the sticks and you have to kick it away. So that's what that's my approach if, if, if I'm Tennessee – 
But it's been so bad in the secondary, I'm still going to say that I think more impactful is Willie Martinez hanging around than uh, in a negative way than Rodney Garner in a positive way. I'm sticking by that. I'm not coming off that, even though you brought me off the ledge just a little bit. I think there are factors beyond Willie Martinez that have made the secondary so bad. I think the secondary was just, I mean, we have to be fair on here. The secondary was just bad in terms of talent. They just, those players just couldn't play a lot of them. And so while Willie Martinez is an issue, a big part of this has just been, look, there was no place that got nuked more than the secondary when Josh Heupel took over. So I, I, I have to be fair and say that, I, look, honestly, I think it's the, I, I, I think you can live in this, uh, in this, with this system, with a very bad secondary, if you have a great defensive line and the offense is where it needs to be. All right. We had a little connection issues, but we're beyond that. Jimmy Himes joins us now as he does each and every Wednesday. Jimmy, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Don't you love modern technology? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I still remember one time filling in for you. It's a true story. Uh, I talk about technical issues. This is the worst by far. You were on vacation. I was sitting there with John Wilkerson and a UPS driver went by and the cords were running all the way out to the truck. The cords got caught in the tread of his tire. Or were you there? Was that was John on vacation? Or No, I heard the story. Oh, all of our equipment got pulled out into the streets. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we're just sitting there like somebody had pulled a tablecloth. Yes. Uh, it was a pretty good time. All right, uh, Jimmy, we were discussing um right when we got you on what is more impactful for tennessee's program a couple of coaches re-signed is it the positive effect of rodney garner being around or is it the negative impact of willie martinez in a secondary that has struggled positive impact of rodney garner uh, i'll go with that one I, I think he's done an outstanding job uh, in uh, in his role as a defensive line coach for the most part, the defensive linemen have gotten better. They now rank among the top five in the SEC in sacks. They rank in the top five in tackles for loss. They rank in the top five in rushing yards allowed per game. And, and I think that if you are solid in that area, it helps you overcome what I would consider to be a weak secondary. So I'm, I'm going to go the impact of Garner's greater uh, to uh, help offset the secondary. Were you at all – surprised that Willie Martinez was retained? Um, well, I did have my doubts because his contract ran out, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, it looks like they're about to make a move. They never did. Um, now, obviously, Josh Heupel thinks more of the work that Willie Martinez has done than some people, including myself. And so, uh, I, I thought I thought the opportunity was there to make a change, uh, but without really knowing Heupel's mindset toward Mar I, I do now, but without knowing his mindset toward Martinez, I thought it was actually probably better than 50-50 Martinez would not come back. Yeah, I was I was along those those lines as well. So I'm I'm curious though, you had two coaches to replace. Mm -hmm. Do you think Josh Heupel was aware of the negative look, even if he fired all three of them? which he didn't. But do you think that Josh Heupel was wary of the negative look of losing three coaches in one off season? Uh, probably. Uh, and I know that from time to time you hear coaches talk about, it's good to get some fresh blood in here. It's good to get new ideas. And I get that. But sometimes it's hard when you replace as many as three to bring in coaches who are under the same philosophy as you they can relate to the players immediately. And that's one of the big things you got to figure out. Do the players relate? I know that uh, Caleb, you've talked about Kelsey Pope, what a great job he's done. One reason he got promoted was when he was a quality control coach with the receivers, he had a great relationship, a great rapport with the wide receivers. So that's a big factor. You're running a little bit of a risk every time you make a change uh, from not knowing what you got to know to prior to that, to that knowing what you've got. So uh, yeah, I think that there would, uh, when you lose three coaches, there could be a little bit of a concern. Now, having said that, uh, he may have improved in each area with the coaches that he hired. Only time will tell. Yeah. Jimmy, um, what do you think of my take, which is this? 
and I agree with you, it's Rodney Garner. What if the reason he's keeping Willie Martinez around is because Josh Heupel, if he has the program where he wants it to be, doesn't think he needs that good of a secondary because he says, my offense can get me a lead. The other team will have to pass to come back. And all I have to do is unleash my pass rushers, guys like James Pierce and let Rodney Garner coach with the defensive line. And I mean, you got good pass rushers against a team that is in an obvious passing situation. You don't really need a great secondary at that point, do you? You don't need a great secondary. You need a competent secondary. <laughs> that's exact. That's the exact <laughs> word I was going to use. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Not running around lost. Yeah. Uh, you, you need a secondary that there, there are situations late in the game where you got to be able to either hold the lead um, or get off the field. And if your secondary can't stop somebody, uh, that doesn't bode well. And I, I, I'm, I realize this is probably a little bit different, but uh, – to my example, but I think about the Florida game when Tennessee made no adjustments to stop this freshman receiver, who I think caught like the first six passes of the game. And it was like, they were clueless as to who he was that allowed Florida to jump out to a lead. And I think Tennessee ever recovered really from that. And that was the offense and the defense's fault, right? Neither one of them played well, but the start of the game, Florida got the lead because Tennessee couldn't figure out how to guard uh, uh, this freshman player from Florida. I think his name was Wilson. So, uh, Eugene Wilson, maybe, but yeah, I, I don't think he looks at it and says, uh, I don't have to have a great secondary to be really good, you know, and have a really good team, but at least you have to be competent. You have to be able to make a stop when it's necessary in particular late in the game. Curious what you think of Willie Martinez as a recruiter. Uh, I, th I think he's about a B. Some people think he's a little bit higher than that. I remind everyone that Jimmy's appearance Brought to you by Ray Varner Ford in Clinton. We'll get Jimmy's take on that in 15 seconds. Three F-150 Ford before Super Cab, 44992. A 2023 Ford Escape all-wheel drive, 30,952. 2023 F-150 Ford before Super Crew XLT, 549. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. Jimmy, would you agree with this? Rodney Garner is a great recruiter. Willie Martinez is a good recruiter. Uh, yes, uh, I would. And now I, I will say this to me, it's harder to define who actually landed a particular player because there's so much cross recruiting going on now than there used to be. But I even think back to when Tennessee got uh, Omar Norman Lott when he transferred in. He had entered the portal and then decided to stay, I think it was at Arizona State. And then when he went back into the portal, his relationship with Rodney Garner led him here. Garner was smart enough not to cut bait with that and not to say, hey, okay, you don't want to come here? Fine, we don't need you. But he kept in, he, he kept a, he maintained a relationship, which led him to come to Tennessee. And he's a pretty good football player. He he is, I think, among defense, interior defensive linemen, he led the team in sacks. So yeah, I think he's I think he's an excellent recruiter. Some think he's lost his stinger a little bit. I don't know. It, again, it's hard for me to judge exactly who you brought in uh, because of the cross recruiting. But I, I think I think he's I think he's better than than Willie Martinez. Uh, and and if I had to guess, I'd say the main reason Martinez main, was maintained on the staff is because he is a good recruiter. And I'm sure that there was no contact with uh, Omar Norman Lott when the with, with tampering, right? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> tampering that's, that's insane. you don't even know how to spell that word yeah t yeah i always get stuck on the m uh jimmy can you hang with us for 10 minutes since we had some connection issues and okay all right uh hang tight jimmy imes the show represented by banks and jones banks and jones well it's because they're tennessee's trial attorney you can play to win with banks and jones because they'll go to trial You've heard of other lawyers. They say they'll go to trial and fight for you. They won't. They just want to settle. That's the easiest way out. Well, that's not Banks and Jones, led by T. Scott Jones. They won't settle. They'll go to trial for you. Tennessee's trial attorney. They play to win. Truly, Tennessee's trial attorney when it comes to criminal defense or personal injury. Why settle? It's Banks and Jones. T. Scott Jones. Banksandjones.com. Jimmy Himes joining us. We're going to fill the very grandiose statement by Tim Banks. His appearance, as always, brought to you by Ray Barner Ford each and every Wednesday. We appreciate Ray Barner Ford. Great selection, great prices as well. 
and great integrity. So that means a lot. Ray Varner Ford in Clinton. Jimmy Tim Banks said Tennessee's defensive line could be the be is the best in the country. Tennessee's defensive line best in the country. What do you make of that statement? Uh, I think that's the coach is trying to engender confidence in his unit to make them feel that they are really look. And I think they're really good. Uh, it's hard for me to put them ahead of Georgia, uh, which is uh, just keeps cranking out defensive linemen. And I don't know what the rest of the nation has. OK, uh, maybe I'll have a better idea of who's returning at Michigan and all these other places. I don't know that. I do think it's one of the best in the SEC. It may be in the top three in the SEC which is pretty darn good considering how good this league is at the line of scrimmage, in particular on the defensive line. But I think a lot of that is trying to pump up his players now. And I think he's got some good players. I think he's got some NFL caliber players. I don't think he's got a lot of first round draft picks on the defensive line, except for James Pierce. I think he's got several middle round picks like an Omari Thomas, like a Norman Lott. I think some of those guys, and maybe eventually some, some other guys develop into that. But I do think it's a quality defensive line, but I'm not prepared to agree to say it's the best defensive line in the country. I'm prepared to say it can be. Um, I, I think I think um, Tennessee has solid defensive tackles and a generational edge rusher and, and James Pierce. Jimmy, tell me how, if this comparison makes sense, what I'm about to do. I think Tennessee's front four now is – Kind of the reverse of the 2001 front four, which I think we would all agree with Henderson and Hainsworth is like a, that's the gold standard of elite defensive lines in college football, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Those, that defensive line was the best defensive line in college football because of two generational tackles and two solid defensive ends in Will Overstreet and Bernard Jackson. I think it's the reverse this time where you might have a generational edge rusher in James Pierce and you might have two with Joshua Josephs. Mm -hmm. And then solid defensive tackles in Amari Thomas, Omar Norman Lott, uh, Bryson Eason go down the list. Is that is that a crazy comparison to say it's almost like the mirror of 2001 where like it's just the ends versus the tackles where the elite talent is? No, I think that's a good comparison. I, I think that I think your edge rushers will be higher draft picks uh, in the NFL than your tackles. Uh, back then in 2001, your tackles were picked higher. Uh, if I'm not mistaken – Henderson was around the number nine pick in Hainsworth 13 or 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they both were, both were the top 15. 15. That, that's highly unusual for a team to have two tackles that are taken that high. So, yeah, I think that's a good comparison. And, and I could see Pierce, in my mind, is already there. Joseph's could uh, work his way into being a, an outstanding defensive end edge rusher who could be a high draft pick. Not there yet, but he could. So, yeah, I think that's a good comparison. I would have said, and I think you would have too, <clears throat> when you and I worked together, of, oh gosh, about 20 years ago, that it's better to be good in the interior at tackle than it is to be at the end. But the way the game has changed in those 20 years, as I mm -hmm. age us, I'm not so sure that it hasn't flipped. You? Yeah, I'd rather have the edge rushers. Uh, I, I, if I'm elite there, because you got to get after the quarterback. I think it's become more of a quarterback game than it was 20 years ago. Not that you didn't have some great quarterbacks, but now there are more quarterbacks who are mobile than used to be. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you got to have people on the edge like Pierce that can get to them. In Tennessee, I don't remember exactly the sack number, 36 sacks, whatever it was. I just know they were in the top five in the league in sacks last year, and they got after the quarterback pretty darn well. So, yeah, I would say – uh, I would say now I would rather have elite edge rushers than tackles on the front four. So we're none of us though are saying that you would trade Pearson Josephs for Hainsworth and Henderson, right? No, because uh, I take Pierce as good as any of them, uh, but Josephs has not reached that level yet. So uh, no, I would I would take Hainsworth and Henderson over Pierce and Josephs at this time. Good stuff. Caleb, jump in here. That That's pretty strong right there. Yeah, I, I agree. Also, because there's so many zone reads now, so many running plays are stretch running plays that almost a lot mm -hmm. of times the edge rushers are more responsible for it. I, I think the most important thing for the tackles is just 
they're almost borderline decoys in this point. They just have to make sure they command the presence of the interior blockers um, to do their job. I so so looking at that. Are we being unfair to the tackles, though? I mean, we're saying all this out loud, but Amari Thomas can play, and he's a great leader of the team. I know I do believe he has a bit of a ceiling, but Omar Norman Lott could be – he had a very good first year playing for Rodney Garner last year, and he could take a step forward. Are we looking at – we, we James Pierce, we're talking All-American, like potential. Mm-hmm. And maybe another edge rusher could be All-American. I think they could. But are we looking at – First team all SEC potential, Jimmy, with Amari Thomas, Omar Norman Lott, and those guys? I think you're looking at that potentially. Uh, I guess my step was where are they going to go in the NFL draft? I, I don't think they're – I think they're middle-round draft picks right now. They may emerge and be better than that. Gosh, I remember years ago – I'm sure you all do too – Tennessee had a player named Dan Williams who somebody on the staff said, this guy can't play defense and needs to be an offensive lineman. And then he developed into a first-round draft pick by the Cardinals, I think. That's right. And I thought the same thing. I thought this guy said it straight to the offensive line. Yeah. And so so <laughs> what I'm saying is the defensive tackles are not a finished product. Now, having said that, and I like Omari Thomas. I think he's a quality defensive tackle. But if he projected to be taken that high, I think he would have entered the draft. So I think – but I think they're good. Uh, really solid players. I Without knowing – all the other personnel and what's going to happen to the transfer portal. I might take Tennessee's two defensive tackles over anybody else in the SEC. That just remains to be seen as to who ends up winding up at Georgia and Alabama and Texas and these other schools. I want to give you the player that I think is the key for that interior uh, and tell me what you think of him. Again, Jimmy's appearance brought to you by our good friends at Ray Barner Ford and Clinton. Welcome to Ray Varner Ford in Clinton, where every turn meets new possibilities and every mile celebrates the cutting edge innovation within our Ford lineup. Elevate your journey in this new 2023 F-150 4x4 Super Cab 44992, a 2023 Ford Escape all-wheel drive 30,952, 2023 F-150 4x4 Super Crew XLT 549. Local you trust, innovation you can't afford. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. One of the strongest guys on the team, but one of the least productive is Elijah Simmons. I was told just banged up. But if there was one player on Tennessee's entire team that I think could most elevate themselves, at least in my mind, because I already like Nico. I I like a lot of the guys that are out there. It would be it would be Simmons. I think he can go from incredibly not dependable to to a, a really solid all SEC player. You. What's kept him back? I, I don't know the answer to that. So I've, I've been told he's been constantly beat up, that he's had minor injuries the whole time. It's what I've been told. Yeah. So so here's a guy that uh, – and I don't know the extent of a lot of, of the injuries, and I know he's been banged up. I get all that. But has he lacked motivation? Is that a part of it? Is he committed to wanting to be a great defensive player? I don't know the answer to that. But to your point – and I'll, I'll refer back to a, a great defensive lineman Tennessee head, and I'll just tell you the story of stuff. But I'm wondering this. Okay, Elijah Simmons, do you want to make money in the NFL? If you do, now's the time. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. I'll tell you this. Reggie White was a, was a very good player his first couple of years at Tennessee. But his senior year, he elevated to where he was probably the best defensive player in the country. And I was told in part was, okay, Reggie, here's your money year. And he took off. And he showed what a great player he was with a great ability. Now, Simmons doesn't have that that talent, okay? Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is maybe the fact that he can be an NFL draft pick and make some money will motivate him to have a better season this year. It's official. Uh, Jimmy just said Elijah Simmons is the next Reggie White. (laughs) Don't put that out there. Caleb, does he do that to you too? All all the time. All the time. All the time. What are we going to do with this guy? But Jimmy, I'll, 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 I'll help you out, though, because we can actually do it on a much less extreme example because I think that happened to Darnell Wright, too, on the offensive line two there years you go. ago. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're right. I yeah, good you point. First. Jimmy, apologize. Point, for Caleb, you're making some good points to this. Throwing heat. It's official. Caleb. Coffee. Can I give Jimmy a shout-out real quick because we were talking yeah. about Henderson and Hainsworth? Because yes. uh, I told John last week, Jimmy, uh, I, I haven't told you 
but I did watch I watched the SEC rewind of the 01 SEC title game and you were featured on it with Nick Saban and they had y'all back to back at one point. And Nick Saban, that was to get in the Matt Malk game. And Nick Saban oh, yeah. said Nick Saban was very PC, but basically said Tennessee's coaches were terrible. But he said, I don't think Tennessee was prepared for the change of pace. And then they go right to you and you go, It's a quarterback draw. How prepared <laughs> do you have to be for it? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Um I <laughs> Is well, and, other, and Rohan Davey was capable of running a quarterback draw. Yeah, Not so you thought run. they would know. Yeah, but he could run it. So why wouldn't you be prepared for that? I yeah. still remember at halftime when it was it Tofield and Davey, they said we're out of the game, remainder of the game. They usually didn't make those announcements at halftime, but they did. Yeah. And I booked my stay in LA for the Rose Bowl. So it's my fault that Tennessee stumble down the stretch i jinxed it so i take full blame for that one jimmy a little premature there dave all right jimmy i appreciate you uh have a fantastic rest of the day and again his appearance brought to you by ray varner ford and clinton thanks jim thanks guys y'all have a good time it's just fantastic well maybe there's a column in jimmy's future that makes that comparison i that would motivate me it did motivate darnell right i thought you brought up a great comparison if somebody says just work hard in the weight room and you're a young man. It's not like you're telling somebody 70 he's got to go in there and bust it. What's shocking somebody about tells me I got six months to make myself millions of dollars. I'm going to be in the weight room as much as I need to. I'll put a cot there and sleep there if I need to. What's shocking about it with Reggie White is that people who do that, I never feel like have the work ethic to maintain it. But obviously, Reggie White maintained it. I mean, he was, became the greatest defensive end of all time. And you would think that they would work, become the traffic, and just get lazy again. But... That's a great point. Like, that guys that play for a contract year, I always am afraid of those yeah. guys. And typically, you're right. They flounder out. But they flounder out after they get paid paid, which your generation is a little different from mine. Reggie White, until free agency, didn't get rich rich. So he kept playing hard, and then I think he took pride in being one of the best. But yeah, you know, again, making a million dollars a year legacy to play for. He started playing even harder. Exactly, and making a million dollars a year in the '80s ain't bad. Don't get me wrong, but there, it's not the kind of numbers that we throw around now. There's also the psychological factor that you and you talk about this because you, I mean, Dave, is it fair to call you a gym rat? Uh, yes, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, uh, you get kicked into high gear so you go to the gym and work hard and practice hard and it kind of becomes addictive maybe for reggie white he did it and it just got addictive because he you know what i mean like you decide to work hard and then the hard work is so addictive you don't want to stop does that make sense yeah it's it, it's it's totally addictive um going to the gym it's better than a lot of things that you can be addicted to for sure uh coming up there is a guy that is already ready to transfer and I don't think Tennessee should make a run at him, despite the fact that he may be one of the best players at his position available. But I'm going to take a bit of a stand with Caleb, who's not going to agree. Two minutes off the hook sports. In its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be we still try to live up to that. Joe Newbert Collision Center. Hi, I'm Rick Terry, and we at Rick Terry Jewelry Designs pride ourselves in the highest quality craftsmanship from a family-owned business here in Knoxville for over 35 years. At Rick Terry Jewelry Designs, we also take pride in being an affordable option for all your game day accessories, especially those fire opals. At Rick Terry Jewelry Designs, we want to be your jeweler every day and especially on game day. Go Vols! Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's your man. We believe every day is a good day to be thirsty. With free samples on draft and lots of flavors to choose from, Tennessee Cider Company prepares a hard cider that's easy to enjoy. 
Some say it's the signature cider of the South. Others say it's the cure to your craving. They all say you'll savor every sip. The area of Gatlinburg has so much to offer, and so does Tennessee Cider Company. Add us to your list for shopping and fun experiences. You'll be glad you made the trip. Find our cidery in the Mountain Mall on the Gatlinburg Parkway. Sip smart. Sip the good stuff. Sip Tennessee Cider Company. Thirsty yet? Doors open at 10 a.m. Howdy, this is Jacob Warren asking you to like, subscribe, and share. Dave needs this. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorneys. Speech. Play to win, banksjones.com. Um, who's this guy? Hello, wizard! The Dave Hooker Show, Ooh. a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. What? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. Back to Dave Hooker. There's two terms that are used oftentimes overused get ready get ready you should stay ready shouldn't you stay ready i mean that to me with that whole elijah simmons things that we we're just talking about if you have to motivate yourself in an off season is a little scary right for not only an nfl club but i don't know i just that it I've been told he's one of the most physically gifted guys out there, that he's the strongest guy out there, that it's ridiculous, that um, he he is just absolutely going to be a monster if he's ever healthy and motivated. And I'm going to put it more on health. I'm going to say that because that's what I was told. I'm going to stick by that. How motivated is he? I don't know. Uh, Dave, who's going to be the new feature on the show since Jacob Warren is leaving? He's leaving? Uh, now we're working on that. We hope to have a major announcement soon. We will continue to work with uh, Cooper Mays. So we love that. His new podcast is uh, up right now. And you love visiting with Cooper. I know you do. And Cooper absolutely loves to be a part of Four Downs. Brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. Right there in Athens, Dynasty Pools and Spas can deliver, well, spa and everything to you i'll tell you more four downs brought to you by dynasty spas the most comfortable spas made in the united states of america right here in east tennessee drop in for the all-new showroom in athens dynasty spas perfect for all four seasons four downs presented by off the hook sports all right here we go cooper mays what down is it, sir? But first, tell us what we need to do. We need to like and subscribe, right? Cooper Mays here. Hit like and subscribe. That's absolutely right. A lot of you haven't hit the like button. I can see that. So hit the like button. What down is it, Coop? Coop here. First down. Caden Proctor. What did you think of Tennessee recruiting him initially and his decision to go to Iowa, which wasn't a very strong decision because now – he is looking around. Caleb, what do you make of Caden Proctor's path to this point? So just to give everybody a reminder of what happened, Caden Proctor transferred from Alabama to Iowa. Offensive lineman was tampered with to transfer when he transferred from Alabama to Iowa. He basically said Iowa was targeting him during the season last year. And now two months in, as spring practice has started, Caden Proctor has re-entered the portal. So you asked me what I make of it. Um, I say that somebody else has tampered and offered him more money. That's my take. Agreed. What down? Coop? Cooper Mays here. Second down. Should Tennessee recruit him? I mean, yes. And here's why I say that. It ain't like Lance Hurd's that much different. He's the same type of player. He just followed the NIL money. And so if you're willing to go for Lance Hurd, you go, you're Dante Thornton. You go for Caden Proctor. And I mean, I think, and not just Tennessee, I think every school around is going to recruit him. I think Alabama, I want to tell you this right now, something crazy. I think Alabama's trying to recruit him back. Honestly. They probably are. And some of their guys are actually <laughs> spending money nowadays. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going willing... to say no. I would not recruit him. And here's the problem that I have, which leads us to. Third down. Tennessee center Cooper made it here. Third down. Dave, why would you not recruit him? Okay, here's why. 
I don't mind a guy that chases the money once. I don't mind the herd situation. I don't mind necessarily a guy that chases the money twice. But this is just simple, fundamental, being a grown-up individual. Give it a go at Iowa. See see if that's a fit. And I can guarantee you in mid-March, you don't know yet. You could still be homesick. I have a son who's going to school far away. There's homesickness. I've got a big, big problem, Caleb, with the fact that this guy doesn't seem to have any dedication whatsoever. The money was always going to be there for him. He could have stayed at Alabama, and once they get their ducks in a row without Saban from an NIL perspective, they're going to start paying players. He could have gotten his money based off his play this season. To me, he's chasing money without as much value because of the way he's chasing it. Does that make sense? Yes, but I can't fully blame him because I don't think it's him chasing the money. I think teams are offering him the money. I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to tell you the truth of what I think happened here. I think Alabama has got their NIL stuff together finally. I think we saw Kalen DeBoer got his salary. He's the top five. He's a, he's a top five, top 10 paid coach already in college football. And I think they gave Caden Proctor a call and said, hey, we got enough money to bring you back. You really like it up there in Iowa? Why don't you come back here where you know you would prefer to be? Okay. And I think we're going to see him say he committed to Alabama in about two days. I think there's a very good chance you're right, which leads me to fourth down. All SEC center Cooper Mays here, fourth down. If you're Alabama, would you take him back? And that is brought to you by our good friends at Dynasty Pools and Spas. My answer may surprise you. Caleb's going to say, I'll do a voice, come on and play because we love you and you're talented. That's the voice he makes. I've been working on that for well over a year. If you're Alabama, (laughs) we can take him back. Dynasty Pools and Spas. Having the best spas made right here in the United States of America in your backyard dynasty pools and spas their showroom is open in athens right off the interstate you can stop by and check out the best hot tubs and spas in the market and then delivery yes they can do that's knoxville or chattanooga they've got complete support spa cover and chemicals to keep your spa bubbling at its best they also have pool chemicals as well dynasty pools and spas amazing discounts for first responders military and even some blemish models that can save you a ton and no one will ever notice mention off the hook sports get 500 off mention off the hook sports get 500 off dynasty pools and spas go to dynasty pools and spas.com or stop by that showroom in athens dynasty pools and spas.com dynasty pools and spas All right, if you're Alabama, do you take him back? He was a highly rated prospect. There's no question about it. He's a very good player at the college level. Would you take him back? Yes, I would. And I just want to address what you said. Weak, weak. Hold on. I just want to address what you said about chasing money, too. Again, you're not chasing it when people are offering you. And if coaches can do it, players can do it. Because do you remember when Manny Diaz got hired at Temple? And then before he even coached a game, Miami was like, hey, why don't you come back and take the head coaching job in Miami? Mark Rick just retired. And he was like, within a month of being hired at Temple, he got, he said, peace, I want to go to Miami instead because I got hired there. Again, you follow. At, show me evidence of coaches not following the money before you come at me about players following the money. I'm dead serious on that. And uh, people will say, Nick Saban went back to Alabama because he didn't like the NFL and he wanted to coach college. Really? He didn't really. He said he wasn't going to be the coach at Alabama. And then Alabama offered him a record contract. And then he went back. Remember, Nick Saban didn't make that decision until he got the $8 million a year guarantee from Al Moore. Yeah, but I, th- I think he was a college coach through and through. I think he was just leveraging for more money. I think that was a Sexton thing. I think he would have gone back for less money. I don't think he needed a record contract hemp house the premier hemp dispensary online with a wide variety great selection and strict standards to ensure you only receive the best in cbd or delta products use the promo code hooked that's hooked for 10 percent off hemp house chat with two t's.com right down below hemp house chat with two t's.com i think he was just looking for the best deal do you really think it was a money play by nick saban 
it seemed like it at the time. Now, I've heard the stories of how they went after him afterward, and they all seem credible. But, you know, you could just create a fake narrative, and the real truth is Saban probably – it's very possible Saban told Mal Moore no. And then Mal Moore was like, what if I give you $40 million, a record contract? And then Saban was like, sure, okay. I need evidence of a coach, and I'm dead serious about this. I need evidence of a coach turning down a bigger contract for whatever reason. Before you guys, before we start talking about players, I can give you one coach. No, no, I know no. I'm, I'm not even, to, it, the money doesn't matter to me. I think you may be missing my point just a little bit. My point is, would you take a guy back to your program? It's tweaked a little bit <clears throat> in four downs brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. It's tweaked a little bit. I'll give you that. But I am not taking a guy back who has left me. No way, no how. I think you take guys back who have left. Don't. People do that all the time with coaches. There have been coaches who left a job, went to another one, got fired, and then the school they were originally successful with hired him back. Okay, I'm don't from say, the Don't say all the time, Caleb. No, not all the time. It may be a couple, three. By the way, 26, 2017, during the coaching search, Dave, with Tennessee, I would have 100% hired Lane Kiffin back over Jimmy Pruitt. I don't care that he left Tennessee. I'm not talking about coaches. I'm talking about players. They are not as impactful. I can live without you. Yeah, but you can take players back who left you. It hap It does happen. But think the NFL free agency. People have re-signed players who left them and then came back. Should Cleveland have not re-signed LeBron James in 2014? Again, I'm not talking about players. You're talking about a guy Wait, who you did say no, you're no, talking no, no, about no. players. Hold on, hold on. You're talking about a guy who changes the whole franchise. I'm talking about one player. I have integrity above that. Now, if you if you're telling me that you're LeBron and you're pretty much going to come in and win a championship, which he did with a and he got to the finals with a terrible team even before that. So you feel like he's going to really turn you into another type of contender. That's different than taking Caden Proctor back if you're Alabama because he decided he made a mistake. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm out. I think it makes Kalen DeBoer look incredibly desperate. Please. Nick Saban would have taken him back too. Okay. okay. Let, me, let me ask you a question then. Would you have taken Henry To'o To'o back, brought to you by Rick Terry Jewelry Designs. They want to be your jeweler. If you're looking for affordable game day jewelry, how about the Fire Opals? That's a Tennessee tradition. RickTerryJewelry.com. RickTerryJewelry.com. Tennessee fans hated Henry To'o To'o. They wouldn't have taken him back. Yes, they would have. Yes, no they would way. have. No way. They would have taken him back in a heartbeat, particularly since they could have used him in the game against South Carolina when Jeremy Banks calls the rift two years ago. They absolutely would have taken Henry Toa Toa back. You're crazy. Yes, I would have taken him back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I would have. And by the way, now this is a little bit different. It's, it's very different because it was recruiting. It's not transfer. But I do want to say, I'll just give a name real quick. Do you remember that time Brandon Warren publicly spurned Tennessee on Hound Dogs and said he's going to Florida State? Yes. Philip Fulmer still took Brandon Warren back. Are you saying he shouldn't have done that? After Warren yeah, he went for a year and played it. He played at Florida State. I mean, he committed there. He didn't come to Tennessee and then say, stick it, I'm out of here. You can take your power tee and shove it. Kane Proctor didn't say stick it. He got offered more money, <laughs> I think. I did, we don't a hundred percent know that we. I mean, he could be leaving because suddenly there's not Nick Saban there. That's a very strong likelihood. Point being, I just think it makes you look weak or thirsty. Is that what the kids are saying nowadays? I, I just don't understand the point. Now, Joel said something. Cooper left and came back. Cooper never, never left. He he angled for about more money. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Cooper never left and came back, but I guess they mean Cade Mays committed to Georgia and then transferred to Tennessee. Is that what they're talking about? Again, that's not leaving the program as a part of the program with all those secrets and all that insight and then going to a rival program. I wouldn't take Henry To'o To'o back if I were Tennessee, and I wouldn't take Caden Proctor back if I were Alabama. <laughs> and the question is, on the message board, would Dave take Caleb back? Well, let's hope we never have to cross that bridge. <laughs> but maybe. Okay. Just, let's maybe throw out just, because Caleb is more like uh, Bruce Pearl than he is Caden Proctor, in that he's very good and special and elite. Not that he's sketchy with 
authority figures. Sorry, bad analogy. And also, but, I like to date women my age. Okay, sorry. <laughs> There's that. But again, you would be, I mean, you would be considered a coach in this regard because you're very important to what we do. You're not just one of 22 starters and 85 scholarships. That to me is completely different. I might have to left and wanted to come back. I might have to eat a little crow. Somebody First of all, Dave, up. you also have to look at the situation. You are talking about Alabama as if they're still a factory for talent like Nick Saban. That factory just exploded, okay? If, like, you're talking – they're not the factory that Georgia is. I think Kalen DeBoer needs all the help he can get. So it's okay, okay to be desperate. It's okay in this particular situation – to be thirsty. It's okay to take, yes, because you're going, this isn't going to be the first time you deal with it. I'm sorry, until they regulate NIL, this is going to be a regular thing. And this is just the first. Kane Proctor is not, and I'm just going to tell you this day right now, Kane Proctor is not going to be the craziest story of transfers within the next month and a half. You know, the spring transfer portal is about to open. Do you know how yes. crazy that's about to get? I'm telling you, this is far from the craziest thing you're going to hear in the transfer portal in 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 a little while and by the way uh y'all are crazy if tyler barron had his head on right tennessee would take him back tomorrow no no and 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 travis says gerald mincy could write an apology letter and put it in the paper he can kick rocks thank you for having some backbone on the message board you don't need those dudes back build yes, it you do. You're build wrong. it by yourself wrong you take you can't build it by yourself. Like again, you win with players. You win with players and you take the players you can get. And I'm sorry, this is I've covered recruiting for so long, and Dave's covered it more than I have. This is so the feeling of when a player committed to another school. Well, they didn't win on my team anyway. How often did you hear that one, Dave? No, no, no. I have heard that, but this again, this is different. They know the insides of your program. This is a this is a, a retroactive spy. I don't want any oh, part are of you it. Still one of those, are you one of those people that believes that like every football team is now like a, a a battalion like in war and they have like secrets that like, I'm sorry, there's too much transferring and coach moving going on now. Everybody knows everybody's that's secrets. That's fair. But let me ask you this. Caden Proctor gets to Alabama. He finds himself a couple of spots down on the depth chart than where he was because I don't know, he transferred to Iowa. Do you think he's not going to transfer again if things don't go his way in Tuscaloosa? He'll leave okay. them again. Okay, and then they'll just replace them. The thing, the, the problem is this. Here's going to be the catch. This is where the re NIL will start to self-regulate. Our Alabama booster is going to give him a big NIL check when they're like, eh, he may come and just leave us again. That's where I think Caden Proctor – see, this is where the market may end up working itself out, Dave. And I'm going to be honest. I think the market may end up working itself out. How long can you keep – throwing money at these players before they spurn you and there's no contract sign. And you just gave a money a bunch of money to a player who's leaving you anyway. At some point, contract there's going to be more thorough contracts entered into these NIL agreements, right? Amen that. I mean, there has to be a two-year contract at, at some point. Hey, if you own a business by chance, do me a favor and reach out to my good, good friend, Tyler, at 865-919-3001, 865-919-3001, because he is your one-stop shop for all your promotional materials. He can certainly take care of you. Again, 865-919-3001, order apexapparel.com. This is somebody who deals with big national companies, so I'm bringing them to you for your business, you get 15% off your first order if you mention Off the Hook Sports. Again, just mention Off the Hook Sports and reach out and call Tyler or order apexapparel.com. The link is right down below. I'm not taking Caden Proctor. Caleb's a little soft and a little too nice, but uh, the Vols certainly aren't too soft and too nice. At least you hope not when the NCAA tournament gets rolling. We'll they better discuss not be odds. soft when they play St. Peter's. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll discuss odds and probably tell more bad jokes about St. Peter's. Uh, hang tight. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This is a presentation of Off the Hook Sports, what you can expect from the Vols, what Vegas thinks, and more. Hang tight with me again, Off the Hook Sports.
Sports Treasures in North Knoxville is one of the South's largest sports cards and memorabilia dealers, featuring over 10 million sports cards from vintage to modern. Sports Treasures carries a full line of hobby boxes, singles, autographed memorabilia, tennis evolved collectibles, fan cave decorations, and so much more. See a museum full of collectibles at Sports Treasures, 4819 North Broadway in Fountain City, and Sports Treasures on Facebook. Sports Treasures, where the real sports fan goes to shop. Have you seen the latest TriStar Hats Co. product? TriStar Hats Co., what's that? You know, those really cool hats, shirts, tumblers, and even license plates with three stars like the official Tennessee flag and stripes like the American flag. Pretty patriotic if you ask me. Ah, I got you. Seen those. Those are cool. Where can I get them? Simple. TriStarHatsCo.com. And if you order now, there's 10% on any order $50 or more. Plus, use the promo code HOOKED. With the promo code HOOKED, you get 10% off. That's HOOKED. And don't forget free shipping with any order over 50 bucks. Stock up at TriStarHatsCo.com. That's TriStarHatsCo.com. There are plenty of wannabes out there, so make sure you go to TriStarHatsCo.com for the best quality and customer service. Will do, and I'll be sure to use the promo code HOOKED. That's HOOKED when I do to save an additional 10% off. TriStarHatsCo.com. TriStar Hats Co. is a trademark of TriStar Hats Co. LLC. Any use without express written consent is prohibited. Now in its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be, we still try to live up to that. If we wouldn't put our family in it, we're not going to put their family in it. If you're going to say that you're doing the best work in Knoxville, now saying it's one thing, producing it and providing it's another. The largest family-owned collision center in Knoxville is Joe Newbert Collision Center. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. You're listening to The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of offthehooksports.com. The internet is full of pictures of each and every one of you. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off The Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Is there nothing you people can't do? Also available on offthehooksports.com. All right, welcome back. If you're on one of our video platforms, you can see the Hooker's Corner page we would like for you to be a part of. And we will have our Hooker Madness hooked on March. How many ways can we use the word hook? Off the hook sports. But go to that. I'll put the link in it as we speak. And you can take part in our bracket challenge. No cost involved whatsoever for you. And you can win uh, several, several great prizes, including gift certificates, restaurants, T-shirts. I've got a prize pack put together that's going to blow you away. But we're running out of time. Go ahead and fill it out right there. Fill out your bracket, and we'll discuss our bracket as well. Also, it looks like Clemson's finally tearing apart the ACC, and this could happen as soon as this summer. Caleb doing a fantastic job staying on top of that. And I remind you that Hooker's Corner is brought to you by our good friends at Sports Treasures. Sports Treasures, over $5 million sports treasures that's a lot of sports treasures and so much more follow on facebook for the best in sports memorabilia they have daily updates you can go to sports treasures tn on facebook follow them follow them follow them i do and you should too because the stuff they have coming out especially tennessee related is pretty darn awesome all right it's time for this day in tennessee sports history so let's fire that off it's brought to you by our friends at quality tire pro what do you got caleb I'm just going to have a little fun with you guys and troll y'all and troll Tennessee fans about the NIT. Uh, it's great. Today. Everybody loves that. Uh, it, Tennessee in back in 1985 under Don DeVoe won one of its most thrilling postseason matchups ever. And it was in one of their most successful tournament runs ever. That just happened to be the NIT that this happened in. Whereas Tennessee held off the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. 73 to 72 at Stokely Center on March the 20th, 1985, to advance to the NIT Final Four at Madison Square Garden. 
Now, there is nothing more prestigious than playing in that NIT Final Four at Madison Square Garden, right, Dave? You'd have to threaten one of my family members to get me to go to that thing. Uh, <laughs> just, I mean, being at the Garden, maybe I would go. Quality Tire Pro, the Everly family, has been serving Chattanooga and the community since 1957. Downtown, right there on Cherokee Boulevard. You can go to qualitytirepros.com, qualitytirepros.com. Say, hey, Bo, off the hook sports sent me. Hey, Bo, off the hook sports sent me. You'll be taken care of. That's where I take my car. So if you're in the Chattanooga area, you need to do that. All right, Caleb, we have decided that you would take Caden Proctor back, and I would not because I'm a man of morals. <laughs> Just joking. How does that tie into this argument? Well, let's discuss Tennessee's uh, potential for the NCAA tournament, which they will play St. Peter's starting off on Thursday evening at 920. Let's pull up the odds for them if we can. Caleb, go ahead and tell me Tennessee's odds to win a national title. And what do you think of the Vols odds? What do we got Vegas style first? All right, so our good friends at BetUS has the odds out to win the national title. Tennessee has the sixth best odds. Let me actually share this with you guys so we could uh, pull that out so you guys can see. Tennessee, so UConn has the best odds at plus 375 money line. After UConn is Houston at plus 600. After Houston is Purdue at plus 750. After Purdue is Arizona at plus 1200. After Arizona is UNC at plus 1400. So the interesting part about that, by the way, is Arizona is a two seed. UNC is a one seed, but Arizona has better odds. But then comes Tennessee tied with Iowa State for six. I'm sorry. No, Tennessee is six on its own at plus 1600. Then right behind them, a familiar face. Well, Iowa State's number seven at plus 1,800, and Auburn is tied with Iowa State at number seven um, at 1,800, at plus 1,800, too. And then at ninth is Kentucky at plus 2,000, and then 10th is Creighton at plus 2,200. But, yeah, uh, Auburn, Tennessee, and Kentucky are six through nine. Does it hurt Rick Barnes if Bruce Pearl goes deeper in the tournament than Tennessee? People are going to be mindful of that. Or is that old news? That's old news at this point. I mean, I will say this. You know, I've criticized Bruce Pearl's tournament resume because it's not it's no better than Rick Barnes. But I'm going to be fair to Bruce Pearl and say he did have a pretty good tournament resume at Division II. I mean, he did win a national championship at Southern Indiana for Division II basketball. So it's not like Bruce Pearl isn't the – like doesn't have a history of going far in tournaments. He does. But – I mean, he doesn't have a national championship at the Division One level, and neither does Rick Barnes. The thing with Auburn is that, again, I think Auburn got a – even though they're a four seed, this is why the seeding stuff is so overrated. Like, yes, they got a four seed, and they should have been a higher seed, but they got a pretty fair draw. And it, I'd rather have a good draw than a high seed. I agree. Well, that's the whole thing with the selection committee, is that, like, the, these numbers are so arbitrary. I mean, the whole thing, to me, is a circus, and it's just stupid. And I think that Sorry, what were you going to oh, say? No, go, I, go, go ahead. I, go right ahead. I, I was going to ask you about that list. There's something that stands out to me about that list. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. I was just going to say that at some point, either reward conference tournament champions or something like that, where, like, get it where some teams get to play the first weekend at their home stadium in college basketball. Put home court advantage in there. Add some value to being a higher seed. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Or I thought of this. If you make it to the championship game, you get an automatic bid. Certain conferences, not not the smaller ones, but much like the college football playoff is doing. But at the same token, though, Caleb, when you were like 15 years old, I thought that the SEC tournament was stupid and that they should bow out of it earlier. Now it's just enhanced by, by the fact that with this pod system, they have to have it done earlier. So I... Read off those top 10 names real quick on, on that list of odds to win the tournament. And I, th there's a point I want to make about Tennessee being among this group. UConn, Houston, Purdue, Arizona, North Carolina, Tennessee, Iowa State, Auburn, Kentucky, and Creighton. Okay. How many of those schools would you say are blue bloods? 
very obviously UConn. UConn's been the most successful program of the past 25 years, and they've got five national titles, and they Great. lead the way. Arizona, I think, is a blue blood. They only have one national title, but I think they're like the class of the West, wouldn't you say? Outside of UCLA, it, Arizona's right there. They they have a natty, but I don't feel like they're a blue blood. I mean, maybe I'm thinking too much ACC, but but go ahead. That that one's debatable. UNC is like not even a question. They're a blue blood. Amen. And Kentucky. So, are we in a a time in which a national title has never been easier to snare? when the blue bloods aren't at their best. I mean, Duke is still, I mean, they're still yeah. reeling a little bit with the Krzyzewski thing. I just wonder if blue bloods is even a thing in five or 10 years. Blue bloods has been dying in college basketball for a while. And, and that's and the reason that stands out is with UConn at the top, because if you look at the most successful programs of the past 25 years, just like, let's just take wins, wins, conference titles, all of that stuff that you take into account. UConn is probably top 10. I doubt they're top five. And they have five national titles. Nobody else has more than three since 1999. So meanwhile, Kentucky, probably on wins and conference titles, probably towers over everybody. They got one national title since 1999. And I, I'm thinking that the more and more college basketball has become a crapshoot of a tournament. But this is this goes way this started for one big reason this started the minute more and more players started either started go, coming out of college early for the for the nba because the truth of the matter is chemistry and veteran leadership and experience become huge in a gimmicky tournament like this don't they yeah they, they, they absolutely do i mean there are a lot of factors that go into selling your program this time of year and one of them happens to be if you're good at basketball yeah and and I think that I think freshmen make mistakes. I, I don't like to sound like the old guy, like, you know, they need experience to do this. But I think you see that more and more in the S in the NCAA tournament. I mean, yes, one and done's is a thing. Teams that win national titles with one and done's, they have like one one and done player and then a bunch of experienced players surrounding them, usually something like that. They don't they don't win it. I mean, everybody talk, you know, Carmelo obviously changed the game when he won when Syracuse won it with Jim Beheim in 2003. And then everybody started trying to do that. But I think co the college basketball, the NCAA tournament has become such a roll of the dice. It's not reflective of the most successful programs. Put it this way, Dave. If if I gave you a list of the top five winningest programs in college football over any 10-year period, any 10, 15, 20-year period, it's a safe bet that at least four of them won national titles during that time, right? Agreed. That's not reflective in college basketball at all. You know, No, it's, it's not. And... And, and and listen, I want I want to make an argument for Tennessee being a blue blood program. If if they ever win a national championship, I think that's the only thing preventing them from being a blue blood program. And once they do that, I think you start to consider them along those lines. But you got to win a national championship. But I think the University of Tennessee has a very underrated fan base when it comes to basketball. They travel well. I think Tennessee is still second in losses uh, or a second wins only to Kentucky. It is a it is a football first community. There's no doubt. But basketball is very significant. The support is there. I saw that again during the Auburn game that I attended. Uh, I think Tennessee's closer to a blue blood than not. You? Yeah, there's a very underrated factor about this. And this is this, Dave, this goes back to when you were in college and when you were in high school at Tennessee, funny enough. One of the weirdest things about the state of Tennessee, even though it, it is a football school, one of the reasons that they do love basketball and can embrace it, Tennessee is a very fertile recruiting ground for basketball, but not for football. Have you ever noticed that? Yes. And it is, it's weird. It's weird where like, it's the, what even though it's a football school, like Alabama, Florida, Auburn, you know, the schools that love football, Georgia, basketball is, has always been a very strong recruiting. And I don't just mean in Memphis, Memphis speaks for itself. That's always been a fertile recruiting ground for basketball, but even outside of Memphis, 
it has always produced some really elite talent, much more than Kentucky or Kansas, which is blue bloods. I mean, and I think that's kind of what's it, 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 it's on North Carolina's level in terms of homegrown basketball talent, which is crazy. If you, but if you look at recruiting history, that's just a fact. And I remember when Bruce Pearl took over at Tennessee, one of the things that was so frustrating to look at, you probably remember how many superstars were across the college basketball world that were from Tennessee that didn't go play for Tennessee because Buzz Peterson was there. Florida won a national championship on the backs of Lee Humphreys and Corey Brewer, both of whom would have gone to Tennessee if Bruce Pearl was there. Is that fair to say? Yes. And at that time, Jamont Gordon was at Mississippi State, the best point guard in the SEC. Bruce Pearl would have, if, if Tennessee had hired Bruce Pearl like just two years earlier, they'd had all three of those guys and Bruce Pearl probably would have had about two national titles. And I think the weird part about Tennessee is it, that's probably why they have such a basketball fan base is because there's so many basketball connections with the coaches, parents of players, former players who know people, things like that, that builds up your fan base. And it actually helps when you recruit. I mean, this is one of the selling points I think of recruiting in-state talent, isn't it? Is if you get in-state talent, you get all the fans of those players from the high schools and things like that to follow your school. Nope. I, I, I've got zero argument with that. Now, <clears throat> I did something unique in filling out my bracket. And if you want to post in the message board who you've got in your final four, we'll get to that Clemson topic here in just a second. So I decided to have a plan. And I went with the reason I wanted to bring up those odds is I went with the odds in every scenario. Okay. So no, I just want to have some fun with it this year. So I have. Uh, UConn making the final four. I have North Carolina. I have Houston. And I have making the final four uh, Florida. So. You have who? And, yeah, Florida. A little bit of a reach here. You don't like the Florida pick? They lost their best play. They lost their inside best player in the SEC tournament. And you got them going to the final four? Yeah. I got Houston going to the final four. All right. So I got Houston, Purdue, UConn, and Arizona. Uh trying to tell an inside joke that didn't play. That, and and I went by every <clears throat> in the first round, it was easy because I went and strictly by the odds, the point spread. Vegas is right more times than not, right? And then when we yep. got to the second round, I actually looked up the odds to win the entire tournament. Not a perfect method, Caleb, but I've got all ones because I want to do it different. And I don't believe in filling out two different brackets. I hate it when people do that. So this is my bracket. I hope I'm wrong. I hope Tennessee goes deeper. It's good for us. It's good for the channel. It's good for the site. But that's where I am. What about you? All right. My final four is um, I have Tennessee. I'll just tell you where I have them going first. I have them going to the Elite Eight. I do think they're going to lose to Purdue in the Elite Eight. As much as I've been down on Purdue, um, I did some research. Purdue is built like the Virginia team that won it in 2019. Yes, they're defense first, but they can score. And they have a dominant inside player. They are a complete team. So I got Purdue and Kentucky in the final four. I think Kentucky's going to upset Houston in the Elite Eight. And then the, the one, the one that kept that gave me the most trouble was Kentucky of all the teams in the bracket. Yeah, they're so unpredictable. And if they if they run into a well-coached team, you know, John Calipari will get out-coached. But I, I think that in this situation, I think Kentucky has a good draw. They can make a run. So I got Purdue and Kentucky. on, And then on the other side, I have UConn and Arizona. So I got two ones. My two ones are UConn and Purdue. And then I have Arizona as a two seed and Kentucky as a three seed. Those are my four final four teams. couple from the message board. Candace says Auburn, Baylor, Kentucky, Purdue. Travis says UConn, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Duke. I'll go ahead and tell you, Travis, and I'm not – kissing up here because you're one of our uh, best uh, best listeners, viewers, whatever you want to call it, uh, and a member of this community, that would be my favorite. If I could see UConn, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Duke. Tennessee among three blue bloods. Can you absolutely write a better script? And Rick Barnes has North Carolina ties. Imagine him playing Duke with those North Car Carolina ties or him playing North Carolina with those North Carolina ties. If there is a better potential final four from the University of Tennessee, tell me what it is. It may not be the most winnable, but as far as getting promotion for your program and having three blue bloods, that would be super cool. That would be wild. 
That would be absolutely insane. You are right. Um, and you I know what? It would, benef- it would benefit Tennessee because they would be looked at as the underdog, even though maybe they wouldn't be up by Vegas or bet US. That's true. I got a question for you, Dave, because you you right. may know something about this. Um, so the Final Four is in Phoenix, and I have Arizona going to the Final Four. By the time you reach the Final Four, is like regional advantage even a thing, or do, is it just so many rich people across the country buying those tickets that it's not really going to reflect the home crowd? Well, I'll put you on the spot for a second. Where is it held? It's held in Phoenix. That's what I mean. If and I have I know, Arizona in the. Huh? I know, but where? What's the actual venue? Oh, and the venue. Yeah. Um, I'm venue. the actual because there's a difference when they hold it in a big football stadium and they half it, then there's a bunch of extra tickets available. Now, it's a terrible fill for a, a basketball game. But if you're talking about a 20,000-seat venue or 22 like Thompson Bowling, I would think that, yeah, the big dogs that buy up all the tickets to the Super Bowl are going to have a lot of those tickets. But remember this. A lot of these big yeah, dogs just, that are worth a ton of money don't want to spend a whole weekend going to, to basketball games. That's true. Well, it is at the NFL Stadium, State Farm Arena. It's at the where the Arizona Cardinals team play. So you think because of that, there will be a lot of Arizona fans that can scoop up the tickets because they're yep. right there. Yep. Now, all right, I'm changing. Here's, here's, the, here's the flip side of that. It's so big that they can be as loud as they want to, and the players might not ever hear them. It's not going to have that much of an impact. It's not like Cameron. I'd read, I mean, it'd be harder to play at Cameron Indoor in front of what? What do they got? 8,000, 10,000 than it would to be to, to play in that in front of 50 because they're literally 200 yards away. That's true, but you have convinced I'm taking it. You've convinced me enough anyway. I think Arizona is now. I had Purdue beating Arizona for my national title. I got Arizona now beating Purdue for my national title. This explains, by the way, why they have the fourth best odds to win it all and they were ahead of North Carolina and Tennessee, doesn't it? Yes. So for the record, I have. Um, the, the national champion winner is UConn, which was the top overall seed. I went chalk, chalk, chalk just to see what it would be like, see if it would be fun. I should be make, made fun of. But my one belief is you don't fill out two different brackets. You get into the same one in different things. You need to get on our uh, Hooker's Corner Patreon page, by the way, and sign up to win great prizes. Fill out the bracket. It goes through CBS Sports. I'll put the link again online. But... Uh, Caleb, do you believe it's okay to fill out two brackets? Have like an upset bracket and a favorite bracket. If you're trying to get paid and win some prizes, yes. <sighs> here's here's the real question. It's stand Dave, that. Do you remember the Warren Buffett challenge back in the day? They had to cancel it. Where if you got every pick right before the final four, you got 275 million, and you could you could get a choice. Nobody ever did, but you could actually get a choice <laughs> where you could either cash out then at 275. Or, there, or try to get the final three picks right and get a billion. Do you cash out at 275 million or do you go for the billion? Do you go big or go home? I'd probably take the financial independence for the rest of my life. That's what I would yeah, do. Yeah, I'm taking so the 275 take, million. <laughs> uh, yeah. So filling out a two bracket, uh, cool or not? I want to. I want to ask our message board that. I think filling out two brackets is right next to. Uh, child abuse. I think it's awful. I don't think you should do that. You should stand by your convictions, Caleb. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you do. That's because you don't bet. So you don't have money involved in this stuff. Okay. <laughs> if I bet my my savings is not in the stock market, man. My savings is on bet US. Okay. <laughs> um, that's that's my retirement fund. Um, but okay. I will say this. I give you credit for chalk because. Yes, it's funny because old Bob down the street always puts picks a bunch of random teams and always has the best bracket every year. That's what people think anecdotally. But if you actually look at the data, you're safer going all chalk than trying to pick upsets year in and year out. That's what I was wondering. Yes, you're much safer going chalk than upsets usually. So, uh, we, I mean. We reset, that, we reset that poll question. I want you to get on board now. Would you uh, transfer back if someone left your program? <laughs> Uh, 64% yes if he's good. Now we switched it up to something. I mean, I feel strongly about this. Filling out two brackets is cool. No problem. Or weak sauce. Have some conviction. Clemson has conviction. They want to get the heck out of the ACC. Caleb, what's the latest on that? And 
what kind of time frame could we be potentially looking at for the entire ACC to implode? I know you have late news on that. Yes. So uh, Clemson is now suing the ACC and they're suing them in South Carolina in an effort to uh, get out of the ACC grant of rights agreement and to nullify the exit fees. Um, and basically this comes on the heels of Florida state doing the same thing. Now, basically what both Clem they're making the same argument Florida state's making. And here's the truth. Here's what they're both making. They're both claiming that the ACC breach contract, what was in breach of contract by not looking out for their best interest. And the argument that they would make is that when the ACC locked them into this grant of rights deal and these long-term bad agreements with ESPN and then went and added SMU, Cal, and Stanford, the move was to make sure they could keep Clemson in Florida State, which, by the way, Dave, the move was to make sure they could keep Clemson in Florida State. That's why they did yes. all of that. Um, and by trying to do that, they weren't actually looking out for the best interest of Clemson in Florida State. So they're going to try to see if they can legally get out of the grant of rights agreement. Now. Because this is going to be held up in the courts. Th this is going to move fast, by the way, guys, because Clemson's just the second school. I know of about four more schools that I think want to get involved in this. And I think you do too, Dave, in the ACC. Yes. I've, I, I, if I'm any school in the ACC, in the top half, I want out of that thing. If I'm in the bottom half, I want it to stay together as long as possible. By the way, on the message board, if you fill out your wife's bracket, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so... I think it's now, well, that's why they added SMU, Cal, and Stanford. Now it's the top third because they didn't want a majority of schools voting to dissolve the ACC, which would have happened. So that's why they went and added SMU, Cal, and Stanford. So they have more voting block, more voting power to nullify the majority vote to kill the ACC, which was the move from the start. So this is going to move fast in terms of schools getting on board. Here's the catch. It's going to move slow in the courts because, Dave, everything. And also, lawyers are purposely going to drag this out, right? They want to get paid. Okay, but if you had a bet that the SEC will have an ACC member by 2025, would you bet yay or nay? I'd bet nay by 20. They won't have one by 2025. Okay. I'm not done. 2026. Yes. Yes, 2026. That's when the new playoff agreement happens. These things are connected. Wow. So you're looking at an expanded SEC, and I know you like the – are we talking two teams? Are we talking four teams? Are we talking six teams? Because they're going to have their pick of the litter. You have to go against the Big Ten, but you have a natural geographic advantage with most of the teams. Yes, yeah, so the SEC and the Big Ten are going to be fighting. And the two – so let's – let's the Big Ten both – te both conferences I think are eyeing 20 right now. I think 20 is the, the, what they're eyeing and four five-team divisions. The SEC at this point has Florida State and Clemson in. That gets them to 18 teams. The Big Ten already has 18. The fight, and guys, get ready because this is good. You know how like cities kind of fight to get a business, a big business to relocate their headquarters to them? And they mm -hmm. humiliate themselves, get on their knees and like, we'll give you whatever you want to come. Yeah. The SEC and the Big Ten are going to do the exact same thing for North Carolina and Virginia. Those two are basically going to open a bidding war for their services to join their conference. And if you got, by the way, here's the crazy part. Everybody thinks North Carolina is a better brand. Look at the revenue Virginia produces. Virginia is low key. One of the most underrated fan bases in the country. They are right there on Florida state and Clemson's level in terms of revenue producing sports. You are going to see the sec and big 10 bite like hell to add UNC and Virginia. And the SEC, luckily for them, has a bit of a backdrop. If they don't get UNC in Virginia, they can probably go add like Miami or Virginia Tech or NC State or somebody like that. The Big Ten probably wants to keep uh, AAU schools involved. What team from the ACC would be the biggest rival for Tennessee if they jumped over? Because you know as well as I do that everybody likes to call Tennessee a rival. Kentucky, Vanderbilt, it goes on and on and on. Um, so what – natural rivalry would occur from an ACC school. I've got mine. I want yours 
Caleb, I want to remind people, Dynasty Pools and Spas, you can have the absolute best spas that are made right in the United States of America. And when you go to that showroom in Athens, you get to look at your spa. Mention Off the Hook Sports, you get $500 off, but they've got blemish models as well. They've got military discounts at Dynasty Pools and Spas. And here's the great part. They deliver within 125 miles and you get everything. You get the spa cover, you get the support bar, you get the chemicals to keep your spa bubbling at its best. They also have chemicals that are made right in East Tennessee for your spa or your pool. That's DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com, DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com. Check them out. Mention Off the Hook Sports sent you, and you'll save $500 on your spa. And they're incredible for a bad back. I can tell you that firsthand. Caleb, the most natural rival that would come out of the ACC is Virginia Tech. It's not the sexiest, but that's the most natural rival. There are a lot of people in Bristol, kind of feels like being sometimes in Chattanooga where you got Georgia and Alabama fans or being somewhere between Auburn and Tuscaloosa where you got Auburn and Alabama fans. Virginia Tech would be a rivalry that would surpass every single rival that Tennessee has that's not Alabama. And I say that because Florida is not going to be a regular opponent. If Virginia Tech was on the schedule, that would be reason for celebration for a lot of the people in the Tri-Cities area. Tennessee, Virginia Tech would become a rivalry on the level of Michigan, Ohio State in terms of a border rivalry if they'd had the history. Now, yes, Tennessee, Virginia didn't go to war with each other. the way. Well, although theoretically they did because Virginia joined the Confederacy and East Tennessee remained loyal to the Union. So there's that there's that civil war history right there, funny enough. But I got to be honest. I I know a lot about Virginia Tech, the program. The athletic department there has been super incompetent. They have tainted the program and at Virginia Tech of what it could be. Yeah, they're irrelevant. And yeah, and they shouldn't be. You know that Virginia Tech should. They have a loyal fan base, a loyal following. They should very, not be a very underrated in state recruiting. Um, very true round as well it's very very underrated and they can very easily get into the washington and baltimore area so you may be taking on dead weight there i'll give you that yeah exactly so virginia tech has been i, I texas a is the number one school in terms of has mismanaged their potential to be a great program i think we agree with that virginia tech's in the top five though quite honestly and that assuming that they change. I agree with you. That'd be t Tennessee's most natural rivalry. But with things as they are right now, based on athletic departments, I would actually switch and go maybe North Carolina. And here's why. Tennessee is very close to being a national title team in basketball in a blue blood. North Carolina comes to the, to the SEC. North Carolina can cross a threshold in football. Tennessee and North Carolina could be a gigantic rivalry in basketball and football at that point. And they're very close to each other. Hit that like button. Hit it now because we've got Kalen who is on the beach doing shots for every 10 likes. So hit that like button. Let's see if Kalen passed out on the beach. Kalen, take uh, a picture of yourself on the beach. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, send that to us. Uh, speech selfie shots. Hooker's corner. We got it all. Um, <laughs> you want to mention? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Dave, do you know what St. Peter's nickname is? Do you know what their actual team name is? They're the Peacocks. Yes, right. Isn't that yes. like St. Peter's is bad enough? <laughs> yes. How about more recruiting news and prizes? Join Hooker's Corner for the Inside Skinny on Off the Hook Sports Inside Recruiting Information Interaction with everyone at Off the Hook Sports, as well as weekly and monthly grand prizes. Join now right below. Uh, or if you're ready to buy instead, just go to uh, our shop where we are selling the 1998 National Championship book. Celebrate 98 The Untold Stories behind the Tennessee Balls 1998 National Championship. For Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation.